Joining us on the panel are Andre Dumit, a Director of Innovation Development at the Aerospace Corporation, as well as Dr. Maxwell Briggs with NASA Cyber Entrepreneurial Portfolio Manager. So welcome to the panel. Great. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So the Aerospace Corporation is a nonprofit, federally funded research and development center. Right. So that's just like JPL's relationship with NASA as a nonprofit, what's called an FFRDC, uh, the RAND Corporation. There are a number of federal labs. But really what that means is we support the, uh, the government. And in our case, our sponsor is the Air Force. We support their needs and requirements and future plans. We sit on the same table side of the table as our government sponsor and support their roadmap development and operations. So I just wanna make that kind of clear just right at the outset. Uh, some of the key uh, activities and work that we carry out include launch verification, a lot of systems of systems engineering, and I'll touch on that a little bit later, uh, technology application, prototype development. Uh, essentially it's the end-to-end -end needs of the space industry, uh, particularly with a focus on government uh, customers, Air Force and Space Force. It is a fairly large organization, 4,000 employees across the country, about a billion dollars in revenue last year, highly technical organization across all, really all technical disciplines. You can see there in the numbers. Uh, very broad geographic swath here. Um, the headquarters is in Los Angeles, but we have uh, a lot of density in other places like in Colorado, the DC area. Uh, and this really mirrors where our customers are. Uh, so you can see the distribution there. This is a look at the, uh, the different kinds of technical disciplines that we bring to bear. So really how we interface with our customers is they have missions, they have programs, they need technical support. We are able to provide them a very deep technical bench in virtually any discipline required for uh, executing space missions. And I have a slide that shows a little bit more about that. Uh, and this is that slide. So when you think about space, there's a lot going on from the very earliest developing of a concept to you know how would this mission work and what are the trade-offs in terms of different kinds of components and lifestyle and altitudes, uh, the design. We, we do really all of that for our sponsors, including modeling and simulation. Then we get into things like procurement, assembly, integration, test, qualifying it for the space environment, actually supporting the launch, and then orbit injection, orbit optimization, everything down, the communications to the ground stations for the actual end users who are going to do something with the data, the information collected in space. And then we even get into sort of the end of life of the space systems uh, as they deorbit and burn up in the atmosphere. We measure all that. We instrument those systems so that we can then get back into the material science and optimizing everything in this whole workflow. Um, we actually develop, uh, as part of our research and development role, uh, a lot of technologies, a lot of systems. We've developed 36 CubeSats. We have 19 CubeSats on orbit right now of 14 different designs, testing everything that's inside of a CubeSat. So structure, calm, power, propulsion, attitude, thermal, payload, telemetry, uh, it's uh, etc. So, and we've got you know ground stations and uh, personnel monitoring that constellation um, all the time. And I think that might be. Uh, oh, here's a quick example of some of the R and D work that we've done. So this is this is like a blanket, but it's actually a spacecraft that takes orbital debris and pushes it back down into the atmosphere for burnup. This is a program that we work together um, with NASA on. Um, we actually help the government identify and evaluate emerging technology coming from the commercial sector. So this is a big trend, right? Startups, accelerators, incubators, universities, tremendous innovation. We help assess it against future Space Force missions. And then there are programs to help uh, fund and develop that. Um, we've worked on numerous different kinds of programs uh, with uh, the Air Force and NASA and NOAA. This is an example of a, of a capability that goes where the rovers can't go. 
so this helps uh, really assess the soil chemistry in uh, a little bit more diversified regions. Um, we've done some work on drones, detecting, characterizing drones, um, understanding communications, coming up with countermeasures for potentially uh, threatening drones. Uh, and as, a, as kind of my final slide here, this is a system that probably touches everyone on this call. Um, so if you have in your pocket a cell phone, it has a GPS receiver and the Aerospace Corporation actually developed the three options for the Air Force to select. And the one that they selected is now called the GPS system. Uh, so that's an overview. Uh, and this is the original drawing going back to 1966 of those different options uh, for the Air Force to select. So just a little bit of history to kind of close out my overview. All right, super. Thank you for that, Andre. And mm -hmm. uh, let's move on to you, Maxwell, in terms of an overview of NASA Cyber Ignite and NASA Startup Engagement. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not going to do charts. I'm just going to, to to talk a little bit about um, uh, about what I do for NASA, and and hopefully uh, it sparks some questions. Uh, so, uh, um, so I do. I work for the SBIR program, um, and I work specifically in. Um, uh, entrepreneurial engagement. And so uh, from the high level, uh, you know, like what does NASA do in commercial space and how do we contribute to entrepreneurship? Um, so it, it's not exactly an easy question to answer because in, in the very beginnings, it, for most of NASA's history, um, you know, the only, uh, 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 the majority of the activity had to be done by large governments um, that had lots of money and could take on a lot of risk. Uh, and it's only in the last, you know, maybe 20 years that that the amount of commercial activity in space is really exploding. And, and especially in the last maybe 10 years with launch costs coming down, uh, you know, you really get business models that were once thought to be completely non-viable. You know, they, they come alive. They, they could close. Right. And so as you start to have this um, this really massive explosion of potential uh, of ongoing current commercial activity, but also potential uh, commercial activity on the horizon, um, you, you get in this situation where, where NASA says, okay, we're not the only, we're, we're certain, we're, we are a relatively small piece of what actually happens in space nowadays. And now uh, that's an opportunity for us, right? So we have a lot of people innovating in space and we need to figure out how to tap into that innovation. And we also need to figure out how to make sure that uh, the United States doesn't miss out on this kind of massive potential emerging market. So, uh, so um, that's a situation that, uh, although it's new kind of to NASA in that space is now becoming this, uh, this thriving commercial uh, uh, area <laughs> uh, it, or space, I guess, uh, space is becoming <laughs> a massive commercial space. Um, uh, it, it, it's not unique to the organization in, in general because uh, it, we had a similar thing happen back before NASA was NASA. It was NACA and the Nas National Advisory Council on Aeronautics. Uh, essentially was doing early stage aeronautics research. And then as commercial uh, aeronautics really took off, we had to answer the question, what do we do now, right? Like what, how do we, how do we make sure that, um, that, that United, the United States maintains a leadership position in aeronautics? And so uh, we kind of, even though we were not the major players in aeronautics at that point, the commercial airlines, you know, they came in, uh, they, uh, they, they do, they did the majority of the, the they put the mo majority of the money and in, into the innovation, but NASA had to carve out a niche. What do we do? We look to the, uh, the horizon. We say, what are the, what are the horizon technologies? How are we going to get massive amounts of, and, and, and that lives on today. ARMD, uh, the Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate, has been doing that for NASA, trying to look at what's the next generation of aeronautics going to look like. And in a similar way, NASA it has to think about that now. As we go ahead and say, yeah, we want NASA missions to Mars. We want to go, we want to observe the, the universe. We can't ignore that we have responsibility for the commercial development of the things that are closer to Earth and have the, and, and do close business models. And so uh, we do that in a lot of different ways. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, sometimes we do it as an anchor customer or a market maker where we say, hey, look, if you can give me a service at this price, I will buy this much of it. Um, or I need this many launches. And so if you can provide those launches or I need this much water on the surface of the moon and if you can provide it, I will buy it. Uh, and that's that's a very large 
you know, a, a lot of resources have been dedicated to that in commercial crew um, and, and, and clips and all of those things in a market making capacity. But we also do things more uh, to what I do is uh, we also seed innovation in that, uh, in that area. So it's not just customer kind of push, anchor customer uh, trying to make markets. Uh, it's also trying to see the innovations that are required in order to get those business models to close. And so my role, uh, I'm part of the SBIR program. Uh, the SBIR program uh, traditionally has had one solicitation at NASA has had one solicitation and that solicitation has been required to do all of the objectives of the SBIR program. And there are tons of objectives of the SBIR program. One of those objectives is to get technology into NASA missions. And so, um, and that is a great goal that we will continue to always use our SBIR program for. But another goal is actual market stimulation. How do we get products into NASA relevant markets and capability into NASA relevant markets? And using the same solicitation to try to infuse technologies into missions and to stimulate markets, uh, we thought, maybe was providing us a suboptimal solution. And so what we did is we developed the SBIR Ignite solicitation, which I'm in charge of, uh, and it's going through its first iteration right now. Uh, and that is really meant to kind of say, okay, uh, if we're going to use, if we're going to really try to seed innovation in commercial space, um, then we're not going to be able to judge it on the same criteria. We're not going to, or we can't ask for the same types of proposals. You know, we, we have to, we have to do something fundamentally different. And so we tried to do that with SBIR Ignite. Um, and, uh, you know, we're in the pilot phase of it. We're going to see how it works. But, uh, but so far I'm, I'm really happy with uh, the results that we're getting. So that's my overview. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And, and Maxwell, I know this is a tough week for you guys with, uh, with some of the competition. So I appreciate you joining. So this is open to all of you, which is um, as we think about uh, the private commercial commercialization uh, of space, right, uh, and all the innovation that we're seeing both from the private but also the public sector, the role that each of your organizations play, and, and prior to uh, Andre and Maxwell joining, Jeff and I were having this conversation, and Jeff mentioned the, the importance of this uh, private, public, and academic collaboration. Uh, so each of your organizations play a critical role in that. So if you can talk about from your perspective of your organizations, in terms of how you guys are, what are you guys bring to the, to, to the mix to bring about this uh, innovation, both on the public as well as on the private side? So uh, I guess I'll start. This, this is definitely a major issue, right? So shrinking technology, falling prices have reduced or eliminated entry barriers to space. I mean, it used to be, you know, uh, Max mentioned that it required governments to get into space. Well, now there's actually at least 10 high schools, uh, two middle schools that I'm aware of that have actually launched space experiments. The Weiss School in Florida Middle School launched an experiment to, uh, to characterize the space environment uh, for uh, one of their experiments that, uh, that they came out to, to Vandenberg to watch the launch. Um, that creates opportunities and it also creates threats, right? It used to be that space was a domain that was really beyond the reach of virtually everyone on earth. Now there are concerns about the threats in space to different spacecraft, the GPS system, et cetera. There's a statistic though, that's rather extraordinary. In the 1960s, almost 70% of the U.S. investment in basic research and development was from the U.S. government. Uh, last year, that number was 70%, approaching 70% for industry being the biggest player in research and development. So when that happens, there is no way for the government to outspend commercial. So the question then becomes, how can the U.S. government in its space programs, and in, my, in our case, we're focusing primarily on the Air Force and the Space Force, collaborate and work with the commercial industry in order to continue to deliver the services, right? GPS Constellation is used worldwide, um, not to mention other key kinds of missions, uh, satellite communications and others. How do you continue to deliver those services uh, securely for everyone who uses that. And so um, you have seen a proliferation of organizations that are focused on doing that. For example, in the Space Force, the new organization Space Works is now focused on do doing exactly that. And they do it really in, in a couple of key steps. One is understanding the needs of the government going forward, right? So what are the missions that they wanna deliver? 
And then second, what are the emerging technologies that are coming out of the industrial-based startups, accelerators, universities? The third piece is what are the government investments that can help bring into uh, play those innovations for government programs. And then the final piece is the actual insertion into those programs. So you can, um, spaceworks.us is uh, the leading organization for the space force. Right now, there are a number of programs. One is having to do currently called uh, on orbit service and manufacturing, how to clean up space debris, how to refuel satellites that are in orbit, uh, you can see a real engagement from the government in the commercial sector, and it's in recognition of this flip of the invest basic R and D investments going forward. How about for Jeff and, and Maxwell? Well, I'll just quickly, so uh, Max and Andre weren't on, but I mentioned our capstone project. So I'm negotiating now. Andre may know that uh, may or may not know this with the Aerospace Corporation right now about them doing a couple of projects in our programs. And they're all around how the US government, so we'll probably interview Max at some point, the uh, US government, aerospace and academia can be a thought leader uh, in, in improving how we bring um, projects and commercialization to, you know, to, to be a reality. Which markets do we focus on? And, and how do we go about doing that? And, um, you know, and then workforce training. What, what is NASA and Aerospace Corporation looking for? So things we touched on, uh, Scott, when we were talking. So we, we, you know, we've done this, I mentioned, with Lockheed Boeing, Northrop in the past, talking with Aerospace Corporation right now. And so uh, we haven't done, we haven't worked with NASA on a project yet, but I'll reach out to Max after this to see if uh, we can uh, maybe get something going. But so we are trying to, you know, to work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say that, so what NASA does to try to kind of um, get that kind of complicated pool of innovation um, headed in the right, right direction it is uh, we, I, I, most of our programming in that um, area is through what we call ESIP, which is our early stage innovation programs. And so, uh, for example, we have uh, STRG, which funds academic researchers to do kind of uh, figure out what the next uh, generation technologies or mission architectures are going to be that are going to be required for us to enhance capability. Uh, the STTR program, which is adjacent to the SBIR program, is tries to take some of those ideas out of academia and get them uh, into market. Um, we obviously do have the SBIR program, which uh, is is the non-academic version of that. Uh, and and uh, but beyond the SBIR program, there's also things like NIAC uh, that are trying to get figure out what's on the horizon. What what, what are the things that are going to really disrupt? Uh, and um, there's other things that are designed to try to because because and, and uh, if I'm being honest, I think that those programs within ESIP are somewhat siloed. Um, I mm -hmm. think that we could coordinate those better. Uh, and there are some attempts like through prizes and challenges uh, that try to kind of say, I don't care if you're an academic or a, a, or, or a, 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 an innovator, a founder of a company, we, we need everybody in here to, to solve this problem. And so there are some examples of that, but I really, I do think that we could improve and we are trying to improve our ability to kind of break down those silos and coordinate the efforts. And I do think that it would help us um, to just have a better mechanism for kind of consensus understanding, uh, as Andre said, of like, or, um, like what markets do we tackle? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if we, NASA doesn't want to put a lot of effort into stimulating a commercial market that no commercial entity cares about, right? Or, um, you know, we, we, we need, but we also can't go up to an individual firm and say, what do you want? Because we're not here to subsidize the investments of individual firms, right? We, we need to, we need to understand on some level, what the industry consensus is for tall poles in the tent, and of those tall poles, which ones are the ones that NASA is specifically well suited to address? So Maxwell, you bring up a really great point around markets, uh, let's call it markets, but also technologies. If each of you can talk about specific areas that your respective organizations are 
uh, looking into or 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 potentially find very interesting, either current or down the road. And some of it, uh, I think, it has been mentioned, such as uh, healthcare in space, energy in space, refueling, for instance, uh, space debris. We didn't talk about PNT, for instance, but other things of that sort. Uh, sure. So I can start off. Uh, so when you look at this idea of uh, on-orbit servicing and manufacturing, one of the simplest benefits, right, is, is I mean, imagine if you could only have one tank of gas in your car, you'd be very careful about where you drove uh, because as soon as you're out of gas, the car is useless. And that's kind of the model that we have now in space. So when we start to think about uh, refueling, most all, in fact, of the satellites that are in orbit right now were not built for that purpose. So if there's a way for us to create a capability for refueling, then this idea of maneuvering the satellite uh, without regret, maneuver without regret is a phrase that you'll hear, uh, becomes interesting and becomes valuable. The value proposition is obvious. So then we have these competitions that where we're trying to get industry and academia to think about what are all the options where you can do that. And when you think about how to actually do that in space, there are different pieces of that, right? There's, you've got to be able to detect the other satellite, and then you have to be able to track it. Then you need to be able to, to approach it. Then you actually have to dock with it. And then you have to refuel it. So when you look at all these pieces of that process, it turns out there's technologies associated with each part of it. Like there's machine vision and 3D scene reconstruction in the detection piece and, and all the way down the line. And then once you've actually docked with it, there are standards associated with that. And there's a body called Confers that's working on those standards. So when we look at the, the, the marketplace, we are interested in new capabilities that can do that better, faster, cheaper in order to bring about this future where we can maneuver without regret. Just an example. Terrific. Thank you. And I can tell you that uh, I've been approached uh, by a company uh, that has a, a VC arm to bid on a government grant um, on commercialization of space that uh, I don't know if it's NASA that's giving it out, but it's a, it's 1.4 million on a special study on very specific on a, 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 an area of commercialization. And we're going to work with them and try to get this. It, it kicks off in the beginning of 23. So we are trying to be active uh, in, in, in getting grants and working collaboratively you know, with NASA and others. I'm sure Max has got a lot of information. Yeah, well, uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it's a great, it's a great question. I mean, there are so many things that have to be solved in order to have like a robust um, space economy. Uh, so I, I mean, I can tell you, for example, I, I have, a, we, we had a solicitation that recently closed and we have, uh, uh, that, that where we had several topics, but I don't want to give the impression that this is an all-inclusive list by any stretch, but um, but for example, active debris re remediation was on the list. Um, you know, as you know, it's that's a tough one because there's no paying customers for ADR right now. But the, you you sit there and you project out the, the amount of stuff that's going to be up there, and you can't have a successful Leo economy unless you're able to to ma maintain safe orbits reliably, right, and and confidently. And so, uh, and that's going to be a problem that's going to require a lot of years of effort to solve. So, so you got to start it now if you want to have that much stuff um, uh, flying around uh, uh, above you. We, we have a Leo, uh, a Leo de destination commercialization uh, topic that is very broad, um, but it, it, I mean, it, it has things like uh, a low cost uh, uh, sample returns from a Leo destination. How, how do you make sure you can get stuff back from Leo? Uh, affordably and effectively. Uh, it has spacesuits are, are in there. Uh, if, you, if you're going to have non-astronauts, non-NASA, non-civil servants up there in space that are, uh, you know, you, you've got to have, um, uh, you've got to have space suits for them to wear. Uh, the, the, the variety of, of, of things that are in that, uh, that are required for the LEO destination topic is, is pretty substantial, but, but that, we were looking at all of them. It's a very broad topic. Uh, low cost solar uh, is another thing. Uh, bringing you're you're going to be putting a massive amount of uh, assets in space, and the vast majority of those assets are going to be reliant on solar power. And you know we've had a massive uh, kind of economy of scale uh, that's happened in terrestrial solar, uh, which has allowed um, 
that industry to really take off. And, and that has not happened in space solar to this point. Space, space solar is, is very expensive. And so um, you can, it, as power becomes cheaper in space, uh, more business models close. So again, it's something that feeds the whole system. Mm -hmm. um, we do have also things that are going on in, in recycling. You know, when, you, when you're going up to space, the first thing is don't take up anything that you don't absolutely need. And then anything you do take up, use it to the maximum possible extent because every atom you bring off the face of the earth up there costs a lot of money, right? You, you, so you've got to um, you've got to make the best use of, of what you have. And it, it, we, we, our topic was specific to kind of like deep space logistics on gateway, but it's, it's extensible to, um, to ISS, uh, any Leo destinations you're going to have, but also uh, it, it's, there, there's also a kind of analogy to ISRU, which is, um, you know, just not bringing up atoms that you don't need, Get, take them from your destination and, and use those. Right. And so that's clearly um, more suited to, to when you actually land somewhere, uh, if you're on the moon and you have some type of natural resource there, but how do you effectively use resources from, from your destination? Um, the last topic we have is actually an interesting one. It's, it's NASA data for climate resilience. And, and that, that the, the one thing that I want to, the thing, one of the things that makes that one specifically interesting is that um, it highlights that NASA doesn't have to be the end customer of the product in order for it to be NASA relevant. So NASA has the responsibility to maximize the use of its data for ter terrestrial use. If we're taking the data, we want to make sure people on earth are benefiting from that data. And so that's why it's NASA relevant. We have the data and we want to make sure that it turns into decision-making tools and products that are helping people live their lives here, uh, especially in ways that are affected by climate. So we have climate resilience and wildfire prevention. If they can use our data in order to prevent wildfires, NASA is not going to buy the, the app or the widget or whatever to go fight the fire but we still have responsibility for stimulating that market and making sure that we're doing the most good with the data that we do collect. All right, great. Thank you, uh, all of you, for those responses. We only have a couple of minutes uh, for the last question. If you could share uh, things that you can share publicly uh, in terms of how your organization is involved in any of the Artemis one, two, three, and subsequent projects. I'll just very quickly, I'll hand this to the others. Uh, since we are in, since I am in the early stage innovation portfolio, we are typically looking to next gen missions. So right now I would say the other folks are probably gonna have more interesting answers than me. Go ahead, Andre. Well, I, I'll have a limited ability to answer that, but the Aerospace Corporation does support NASA as one of our government customers in really, if you remember that, that workflow chart in all phases of that. Uh, so I know that we also have a, a, a crude support piece working out of our, um, I think it's uh, out of our Texas office, supporting NASA, uh, including uh, astronaut health and uh, spacesuits and a number of other areas. Uh, so we do have a whole NASA supporting division of the Aerospace Corporation, which I think has at least 100, 100, 100 people supporting. Uh, but beyond that, I wouldn't be able to give you too many specifics. Understood. And I don't have the specifics. I do know that we are working on Artemis uh, out of the Space Institute, but I don't have the details of what specifically what they're working on. But I, in our advisory board meeting, it's been mentioned. Well, I want to thank Jeff, Andre, and Maxwell for a terrific conversation. Please give them a round of applause. And this concludes our Astro Perkins quarterly event for today. And thanks, everyone, for joining online. And don't forget to join our next quarterly event on April 26, 2023. Look forward to seeing you then. Have a great rest of the day. Bye for now. Stay healthy. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye.